want to say good afternoon, welcome. Uh, so, I'm Adam Lear, uh, I'm the GovCMS Technical Product Manager. Uh, with me this afternoon I've also got Nathan Wall, who's the uh, head of GovCMS, the GovCMS Service Manager. So, you know, this is a topic that, uh, that lots of people uh, have, you know, talked to us about over the last few months in particular. Um, so for me, I've been developing and working on Drupal for a number of years now, um, but you know, in comparison, that's probably a small amount of time compared to uh, some amount of people in the room. And I've only ever worked with Drupal 7, but in that entire uh, life cycle, I suppose, you know, we've been looking forward to Drupal 8, and there's been a, a long development roadmap of, uh, of that, and it's been a long horizon. Um, but on November 19, 2015, Drupal.org did release the first supported version of Drupal 8. And ever since that was released, uh, I suppose it's been that thing that we just keep getting asked about. You know, GovCMS is a successful product for a number of agencies, um, but there's a number of compelling uh, reasons to, uh, to go to Drupal 8. Um, and you know, essentially, when is our managed platform going to uh, to pick this up and run with it? And obviously, as a managed platform, it's it's a little bit more than just grabbing a distribution or creating a distribution and, and you know, putting it out there on, uh, on Drupal.org. We need to be able to support that. And we need to have uh, confidence in it. And uh, so, there's a number of customers that are using Drupal 8 as it stands today in our platform as a service environment, for instance. Uh, so that's, you know, that's, it's not a barrier to being able to use uh, Drupal 8 on GovCMS hosting or even out you know, with your own hosting and that sort of thing. Uh, but for us, in terms of a, a more fully-fledged um, managed hosting platform, it was something that needed a little bit more consideration. Uh, so we've learned a lot of lessons from developing Drupal 7 um, into GovCMS. Uh, that we don't really want to repeat. Uh, and so we've taken sort of a slowly, slowly approach to adopting uh, Drupal 8 at this point. And um, there's many reasons for this. Uh, broadly, they scale down to uh, technical and architectural reasons. Uh, with Drupal 8, uh, many of you might be aware that Drupal's moved to uh, a more modern PHP framework uh, called Symfony 2. Uh, and this resulted in not so trivial changes to, uh, to Drupal under the, under the hood. Um, and so it's, it's effectively meant that popular components uh, have had to be recreated, sometimes from scratch. Uh, a number of other components have been integrated in the core code base. Well, there's modules with the same name now that have just undergone a shift in terms of you know, what functionality they offer. And so it's not just a, a matter of picking them up and, and putting them into a, uh, a new code base. So with so many variables um, and needing to support you know, a brand new product such as that. Uh, we chose to avoid the bleeding edge for our government customers and, and wait for a natural maturity uh, to develop, um, you know, especially as I, as I note you know, the underlying managed hosting platform that, uh, that we have to support uh, along with our, our services partners. Um, in the middle of last year, uh, GovCMS as a uh, our operations team, uh, they began to do some work uh, on looking at Drupal 8 and the feasibility of that. So, it, well, it's not so much that, that we, we've been sitting here and we haven't you know, looked at things and we haven't done things. There's a lot of things happening behind the scenes. Um, and we had a fairly extensive look at Drupal 8 at that point around about June or July. And unfortunately, the feedback that came back was that looking at the functionality that we have in Drupal 7 currently, uh, there, was a, there was a bit of a, a maturity gap between where we were now and some of the core critical functionality that, uh, that our customers would be expecting with uh, a minimum viable product on, on Drupal 8. And so um, we had some issues with views when we went through testing. Views is now in core in, um, in Drupal 8, uh, but there was a number of, uh, of bugs that we came, uh, came across. And so at that point, uh, and that's only one example, but there were many others as well that we sort of said, hey, for a managed platform, we're going to take a more reasoned approach and a more careful approach to, uh, uh, to the platform uh, from that point. So fast forward another six months and we're, we're basically here. Um, we start to see some compelling reasons uh, to begin to, to, to move at this point. So we're seeing the community really start to mature and adopt uh, a lot of the, um, the, the features behind 
uh, Drupal 8, and we're starting to see some movement in some old bugs that we've been monitoring for uh, uh, for some time. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, we're now at a point where customers as well are being able to articulate reasons that they actually want um, features to you know in the Drupal 8. Uh, you know, world as well that you know either either aren't really something that we can uh, develop easily with Drupal Seven due to architectural differences, um, and they're effectively you know much more compelling reasons, uh, especially for us as as platform managers as well when we look at uh, caching and that sort of thing. So that's some of the things that I'm going to uh, to talk about as well uh, today, just in terms of. Uh, you know, some of the functionality that we're excited about, some of the pain and the lessons learned uh, that we're looking at as well to, to provide improvement uh, to Drupal 8 and an improvement on the current service offering that we have. And I think there's also some things that, that we're interested in as a program in terms of not even just the core Drupal experience, uh, but taking that from 7 to 8, things like we want to have more comprehensive testing. It's one of the uh, one of the limitations that we have in Drupal 7 at the moment is that our test coverage uh, across the whole system is not as good as it could be. Uh, there's, you know, we want to to increase our level of assurance, and it's not specifically a Drupal 8 thing, but it's a really good opportunity when we start from from effectively from scratch uh, that we can bake this thing, uh, bake things like continuous integration and testing right into that core process right up front, whereas maybe we missed some of that maturity uh, two years ago uh, when we first started this, this project. So there's a few particular Drupal 8 features that I've uh, picked out that we're looking forward to. Um, and they cover sort of vast amounts of our product offering from you know, the user experience side, uh, performance optimization, configuration. Uh, and so if we just give a, a little bit of a, an overview here, and on the user experience front, for instance, uh, there's, a, there's functionality called Tour, uh, and it's baked into uh, to Core. And you know, I really do imagine a, an experience where we can step first-time users through various aspects of the, the onboarding process and learning how to be content authors. Because this isn't just a platform uh, to build websites, it's also obviously a platform for editing and, and maintaining content. Uh, and so what we want to do is develop uh, a content authoring experience uh, that, that feels second to none, uh, that allows people to step through those experiences, uh, know and have confidence in how they're delivering that content uh, and workflows and, and all that type of thing that, that we take for granted in, uh, in Drupal 7 at the moment. Uh, but we're just going to, to take that up a notch in terms of you know, built-in tutorial systems within uh, the product as well, uh, which Tour really gives the, uh, the benefit. And if you've seen you know, sort of uh, you know, tool tips with Next and that sort of thing on them, where you'll get a bit of a description and you can uh, cycle through those and get an interface uh, overview of different aspects that are, that are on a screen uh, and potentially to be able to even hit uh, a question or a help icon um, you know even after you've logged in for the first time maybe you only log in every six months or something uh, and to be able to oh that's right that's how you do that thing uh, and so we're trying to bring contextual help uh, you know to the fore uh, for users to be able to uh, to work with the system on a regular basis uh, on the performance side uh, Actually, show of hands, um, people who use Drupal 7 and try to use that extensively with, with caching, um, who, who has experience with trying to wrangle Drupal 7 to you, caching and that type of thing? There's a few hands, quite a few hands. So on a managed side of things, um, you know, all of that starts to come down to case by case. Uh, you know, there's not a lot that we can do as a program over the whole. It's an individual site type of configuration where... Uh, you know, if, even if we look at content delivery networks and the modules that are available for um, for GovCMS to be able to put in there to manage things like you know, Akamai that, that is um, the other uh, front end at the moment, uh, essentially one of the difficulties is that Drupal itself doesn't actually realise when a node, uh, in some cases, uh, where that appears on the site. So you've got some basic stuff like views where you can pull in content uh, and you can see, uh, you know, you, can, you know that that's there. 
uh, you know that you can expose that. But when the when you're using the simplistic um, module and functionality that is there for clearing cache at a global level, uh, you need to extend that module and almost start writing custom database queries to be able to uh, to really connect and pull out, you know, where across this site is this piece of content reused, and that has a real performance impact uh, on a managed platform when we're trying to uh, to manage that process, and so. Um, there's a few things that Drupal 8 does for us with caching that, that's really welcome. So, uh, in particular, it comes with an internal page cache enabled out of the box. Uh, Drupal 7, I'll note, does have one, uh, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not well integrated into other components as well, and it is off by default for, for a number of those reasons. Um, it's effectively a reverse proxy. And so, you know, it reduces on its own Drupal's uh, page load and bootstrapping process significantly. And that's before we even get to cache tags. Uh, and so one of these struggles is finding the effective balance of time between how long do we cache something for at a content delivery network layer um, and you know, how do we allow agencies, though, to update information that's really important to them and have that flushed out reasonably quickly. Uh, and so if I update a block, uh, naturally, you know, you want all those those pieces of content to be flushed as quickly as possible, and so you know we'd love to be able to, at a platform level, be able to cache basically all sites that uh, that you can, um, effectively indefinitely, and then you only have to update them when content changes, and uh, and that's really hard with Drupal seven, but it becomes much easier with Drupal eight when we start talking about cache tags. Uh, because all of that exposed structure of where blocks and where content appears and is being reused uh, extends right across the, uh, the Drupal uh, ecosystem from, uh, from core, effectively. And so that's built in um, part of the entity, uh, entity API um, right out of the box. So the benefit, obviously, for us in that case is that we're able to really uh, supercharge the caching effort uh, to be able to deliver faster sites uh, with less impact on uh, on our servers themselves with our service provider, which actually frees the platform up to be able to respond to post requests and that type of thing uh, and leave the get requests as much as possible uh, to the content delivery network. Um, so, yeah, and the, obviously the other benefit for this as well is, is cost savings. Uh, the further we reduce load on infrastructure, uh, it, it benefits all of all of GovCMS customers. So, you know, if we don't have to uh, to fetch from Origin uh, for a term, uh, those who are used to uh, to content delivery networks, if you don't have to fetch from the infrastructure on a regular basis, uh, then we're not going to have to you know, incur the large costs of uh, you know running that cloud infrastructure uh, that's you know quite a bit more expensive than running the content delivery network itself. Uh, the other performance item that I just want to touch on briefly is, is Big Pipe. Uh, so this is something that was originally developed by Facebook, uh, and it allows cache content uh, to be sent to the end user really quickly. Uh, and so dynamic parts of the page will load much faster, um, and also later. So instead of waiting for the web server, as is in traditional models of having to uh, render the entire DOM model with the exception of some JavaScript components and then push that out to the browser, um, users have this better initial experience of being able to consume potential informational content in particular straight away, while some of those more dynamic pieces, you know, they might take a few more seconds to appear. And, and you see that with Facebook about how quickly it loads uh, particularly things like, you know, you might see the chat bar um, or the news feed. So the news feed itself loads really quickly. Uh, and there's some other elements on the page like chat down your right-hand side. Uh, they might take a little bit longer to load up. And that's something that, uh, that Drupal 8 has, uh, a, is, is, I think it's in beta at the moment in 8.3. Um, and so that's something that's going to, uh, to be particularly useful uh, for us as we look at performance across sites as we go forward. Uh, finally, I'm just going to touch before I move on to the next se uh, section. Uh, Drupal 8 has this API first approach, and basically, this will allow you to run Drupal or GovCMS as an entity interface. Uh, your front end will be able to pull content from it. And this sort of thing allows GovCMS to be a central source of truth for your content. 
uh, content as a service, if you, if you like. Uh, you can have mobile applications, kiosks, and other systems easily consume that content from your site. You can decouple your theme. Uh, you don't even have to run a Drupal theme uh, with Drupal 8 if you don't want to. You can decouple that experience uh, and run with a number of uh, you know, the JavaScript frameworks and on front-end development and that sort of thing uh, that are popular these days, Angular, Ember, uh, that style of, style of uh, effect. But <clears throat> I do want to touch on a, a couple of pain points as well in the current distribution beyond what I've talked about. Uh, and just some of the things that, that a rebuild allows us to, to really reset and refocus. And, and hopefully for some of you that are here looking at, you know, what is GovCMS doing in this space? Because, you know, it's not perfect and there are some things that we can do better. This is a real opportunity for us to, to take those lessons that we've learned and really apply them again and say, right, this is where we want to go. Uh, and particularly one of those issues is permissions. Um, <clears throat> Who is running the permissions with Drupal 7 with GovCMS currently? There's a few few hands. That's less than I was expecting. Permissions, uh, they're one of the things that we're, we're running all the time trying to, to catch up to people's experience and what they, what they want to get out of the system. Originally, uh, the GovCMS current permission model was designed with smaller agencies in mind. The whole GovCMS program was designed with smaller agencies in mind. And so there are some decisions from that that sort of have some legacy impl uh, implications at the moment, where uh, when we first envisaged this product, uh, we sort of thought about it as, um, you know, that it would be helping the, the smaller agencies with, you know, half an FTE or an FTE manage their site. And so there was an opportunity there to be able to, uh, to give them the power that they needed, but also take away some of the, uh, the dangerous elements and, and manage the platform like that. But as we've matured, we've seen a number of agencies, and particularly bigger agencies, come on board with their own capability and skill that have seen GovCMS as a managed platform and said, hey, we really love this concept. We don't want to be managing code bases. You know, we don't want to be patching and we don't want to be doing all of this stuff. Uh, but we want a little bit more power and control. And so Drupal 8 gives us the ability to reset um, and instead of trying to catch up permissions, we can just start from, uh, start from a fresh, start from a, a really good base of what those permissions look like for everybody uh, and go from there. So in particular, there's a couple of things as well that I want to look at um, that come down to content staging um, and content preview. And so there's a number, there's a number of modules uh, in the Drupal 8 world at the moment that... Uh, that we're working to, to investigate at the moment. I know uh, Nathan and, and myself have done a little bit of work in, in this space, uh, and they're not quite there yet. It's quite easy to, uh, to break some of this functionality, but when I look at, and I'm just going to try, I'll just tell everyone right up, we had, we had this as a 20-minute session. You know how you wake up on the morning of conference and you suddenly realise that your session's 40? So um, just let me flick through a couple of things and I'll... Um, Let's uh, see if we can... No, it's not going to let me. That's all good. So there's a whole suite of modules that are available for, uh, for Drupal 8 that allow us to do content staging. And they're things that, that are either brand new or they have a name that's maybe familiar to Drupal 7 people, but it's been completely repurposed. So uh, something like Deploy which previously in Drupal 7 was a content staging module. Uh, it's been completely rewritten to sit over the top of a number of other modules in this space. Um, things like multi-version, uh, which is like content branching, where everything, every single entity can have a revision. Um, and when we get into uh, multi-version as well as replication, we can start to replicate content between a target uh, and a source, and that actual replication can happen with, with the uh, deploy module. Um, when we look at uh, the way that we edit content as well, there's a, there's a module called Workspace. And essentially, what, the way that people edit content currently on GovCMS is often they'll edit that content in the live environment. Uh, and when they do that, they're sending around preview links uh, to, to you know, stakeholders internally, trying to get approval so they can move through the other workflow processes and get that signed off. Uh, one of the things that Workspaces does is it allows you to set up dedicated live and staging environments on the one domain, effectively. 
and it allows you to flip between those states. So you might be in the staging environment and be able to, to write a whole heap of content uh, that's specific to the staging environment or the project, potentially even a workspace of an annual report, something that's maybe a little bit longer term uh, than just the here and now. And that would allow you to isolate that content and to be able to send that to a stakeholder to be able to get approval without a whole heap of um, preview addresses that don't really sit nicely within the scope of you know, the rest of your website. If you click on a, a menu link, for instance, it takes you back to the live content uh, for that particular content item. So, uh, and that's some limitations with the, uh, the current um, Drupal uh, 7 GovCMS instance at the moment. And we're looking at really changing the way that we do content staging because we know that that uh, is something that our customers have been asking for and it's something that we've found particularly difficult uh, with the current state of play with Drupal 7. Uh, and so with a number of changes in Drupal 8, particularly improvements with the Entity API and the like, um, you know, contrib module authors have been able to take advantage uh, of some of this functionality to be able to, to really improve that experience. And I will say it's not perfect. We've taken it for a test drive and it's fairly easy still to break that implementation. Uh, it's still fairly easy to accidentally uh, break the website while you're trying to push content from one target source to your live site. So at this stage it's not perfect and it's not quite ready for prime time, but now's the time for us as a, you know, as a GovCMS team and with our operations area internally, as well as with the community, and Nathan will talk a little bit more about that later, but there's an opportunity to be able to really connect with that uh, and contribute to that program of finding something in Drupal 8 that you're really passionate about and being able to contribute to that. So, I think on that note, you know, this all sounds great, but what about timing and how do we get from here to that point? Um, so we're in build and we're prototyping, we're testing a lot of these concepts and ideas at the moment, um, but we also, as I said, we need community involvement. And for that, I'm going to hand over to Nathan Wall, and he's going to discuss that a bit further. Okay, so Drupal 8, as you can tell, well, maybe what Adam's relate to you, he's kind of excited about it, but kind of excited. Um, the journey has already begun. We've actually started building in Drupal 8 now. Um, the, the question for you, as part of the community, is would you like to join us on that journey? We actually have the GovCMS roadmap, and it's publicly available. Um, it's currently sitting in a Trello board, and it's open for everyone to see. I'm not going to dwell too much on it here because I know you kind of can't read the detail. If you want to see it, just go to govcms.gov.au slash roadmap. It'll bounce you out to the Trello site. Uh, you actually need to go and join the community website to have a conversation about it, and everyone is welcome to have a conversation about the roadmap. There's a few things we need to do in the roadmap that's not actually specific for Drupal 8 uh, that's going to get us to a point where we can actually operationalize Drupal 8. The first one of these, and I'm really excited to be talking about this one, uh, is that we're going to increase the security accreditation of GovCMS to unclass DLM. Now, those of you that are not intimate with government security classifications over content, unclass DLM means that we can actually start to handle sensitive material on the platform. It doesn't mean we can handle material with a security classification like protected or top secret, etc. But it does mean that the platform can handle personal information, basic details about a person, their name, their email address, their phone numbers. At the moment, because we're only unclassified, if you're in a web form, for example, that collects a little bit of information from a user, if we're doing it the best way possible with what we currently have, you have to flush the web form immediately after it's submitted, send the details as an email, and nothing is saved long-term in the database. If we get to Unplus DLM, you can actually save that data in the database. You still need to review the information to make sure you're not collecting anything that's above the Unplus DLM accreditation level, um, but it gives us more flexibility about the types of things we can do on the platform. Naturally, if we do that for Drupal 7, well, we have to do it for Drupal 8 as well. The next thing in the, the overall roadmap, um, this is mainly affecting our software as a service offering. Uh, we need to do some changes to the way that infrastructure is currently set up 
so that we can run Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 simultaneously. We're not going to stop our investment in Drupal 7 just because we're starting Drupal 8. We're not going to force agencies to start shifting over from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. That's their choice. It's not going to be ours. Uh, we're looking at things like more resilient servers. Um, we're probably going to switch over to SSDs for our disks rather than magnetic disk. Makes the performance of that environment just a little bit more robust. Uh, there's also, at the moment, uh, a contract that's being refreshed that covers our CDN, our DDoS protection services. We're going to make sure all that's in place so that we can wrap it around anything we do in the Drupal 8 space as well. Uh, GovCMS Parks. This is one of our themes that we've been working on. Uh, currently, anyone that's familiar with GovCMS will know that the out-of-the-box theme is probably a little tired. It's been around for a while and it doesn't quite match the direction that our DTA colleagues are wanting government to start thinking about their sites. So GovCMS Parks is going to replace our current Drupal 7 based theme. Uh, we're currently working with our colleagues from the DTA and other agencies to help Drupalize that theme because the UI toolkit as it comes from the DTA is not a Drupal thing. They're doing it as a generic toolkit that can be used across all sorts of different platforms that government might be using. Um, so we're helping to get it ready for Drupal. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about some of this work in the final session today. Now we're starting to get into the Drupal 8 specific part of the roadmap. Um, as Adam mentioned, we've done a little bit more of that early technical assessment and the team is now thinking that Acquia Lightning might be a reasonable starting point. It seems to have most of the functionality in it that we would need to be able to support a minimum viable product, a minimum viable release of Drupal 8 for GovCMS. There's probably a few things in there that are missing. So instead of trying to create a huge, big, almost complete distro, we're going to start small because we actually need involvement from the community to tell us what functionality they need in the distro. And that's also going to help us avoid some of the problems we had with our Drupal 7 version. Um, that said, I myself have played around with some of the things in Acquia Lightning, and as Adam alluded to, I broke some of the stuff really quickly. I'm good at doing that, um, but it also gives me a little sense of caution. As a service manager, I don't want to dive headfirst into this. So our roadmap is, is coming, and we're going to get there. It's just going to take a little bit of time, and I'll walk you through some of that. To help us, we're actually going to be looking for an early adopter. Um, it's the kind of thing where we'd like to negotiate on the timeline and scope. We've done some thinking about our timeline, I'll show that to you in a minute. I think that's what's possible if we, Department of Finance, are the main sort of, uh, players in implementing that. If we've got a project though that's kind of ready to go, uh, an agency that's willing to invest in the collaboration that's going to be required, um, and if there's a little bit of room to negotiate on the timeline, um, we can probably partner up and do something together. Um, there's a bit of an advantage in an agency doing that. Um, I'm going to say probably here, because we have to confirm this, um, but finance would probably be able to co-fund some of the work. Certainly we'd be paying for the IRAP assessment, the security accreditation of the new distribution, because GovCMS would be managing that distribution going forward. Um, we've got some internal test resources, we'd, we'd be able to contribute to that process. And our dev team would really like to talk to some of the other devs to make sure that we're collaborating and heading in, in the right sort of space. Um, we'd help manage the distro throughout that entire process. Um, we're already talking to a couple of agencies, but no one's actually said, yes, let's do it. So if you're keen, come and talk to us. A little bit further down the roadmap, it's not on the critical path, um, is a Drupal 8 version of a GovCMS theme, and we're calling it GovCMS Whitman. You can probably see there's a bit of a naming convention happening here. Uh, our friends at the DTA have very recently released version 2 of their UI toolkit. Um, our Drupal 8 version of the theme is going to be delivering version 2 baked into that theme. It's an active collaboration. It's a bit of work involved. The guys have spent a couple of weeks and a couple of working sessions here with a number of agencies. Again, you'll hear a bit more about that shortly. Um, we're, we're pretty excited to be able to make this happen. The work that's coming out of, of this collaboration uh, is, is proving to be an extremely positive thing. Here's the rough timeline 
that we're working to right now. Um, the product starting, I've said now, but reality was a little bit earlier this year. Uh, our SaaS infrastructure updates will be happening, the new protection services, the contract's got to be sorted out in April, so that's not going to take very long. The team's relatively confident that we would have an alpha version of our Drupal 8 distro ready by the end of the financial year. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means we've probably done some more experiments. We've probably worked with our early adopter to see what functionality gaps there might be on Drupal 8 Lightning. Um, if it turns out that Drupal 8 Lightning is not the best distro to use, there are other options around. Um, I am also cautious hearing from uh, Dan Sparks just earlier today. He was telling us about the work that the New Zealand government's been doing and they've started work on a Drupal 8 distribution and then stopped when they found that the media module's just not up to scratch yet. So are we facing the same challenges? Yes, we are. So instantly, we've now got an opportunity to collaborate across the ditch with our colleagues in New Zealand government and try and make sure that we solve this because I'm pretty confident we're going to need the media module too. That's a safe bet for me. Um, there's going to be some more experiments that we need to do on some of the modules. Uh, Adam said, yeah, we've got new, new modules that don't, previous, don't exist on the Drupal 7 version. Um, so we're not going to port over functionality that's not required. Um, so there's more of that assessment. The theme update work is going to continue during that time. Our beta, we're thinking we'd have something available about September. What that beta is, I don't know. It could be a beta of the GovCMS website. Ideally, it would be a beta of one of the sites that's already out in the community. Um, that means we should have a working distribution with a running site. It means also that at that point we can't quite go into production because we are government, there is some work that needs to be done. And it's at this point that we'd be finishing off all of the accreditation work. And that would be on the infrastructure, on the distribution, doing all the security reviews, finishing off all our testing, and then we're ready to put the, the stamp of approval on it and say we're ready for production use. And that, we think, is probably around November. Now, some of this timeline we can probably shrink, but it is going to take investment from the community. Maybe one or two agencies could partner it. So you're all saying to yourself, this is great, how can we participate? Well, you can start a discussion on the community website, uh, community.govcms.gov.au. Uh, you can join us at the next GovCMS camp uh, and help us build that future. Uh, not quite sure when that GovCMS camp is going to be, but I would very confidently say before the end of the financial year, uh, it will give us an opportunity to have the community involved in that alpha work. Uh, the camp we ran earlier this year was incredibly successful. We had about 30 people join us and they worked on a range of projects over a day and a half. Um, this time around, we might refine the theme of that uh, camp so that it's just working on Drupal 8. And it could be evaluating modules, it could be doing some testing, it could be actually uh, doing a bit more in-depth understanding of, of what it means to build a theme in Drupal 8 as opposed to Drupal 7, because um, it's quite different. If you need more information, here's our standard email address, contact the theme, go CMS at finance.gov.au, we're happy to talk. Now, speaking of happy to talk, we're going to throw open to questions and conversation from the floor for the rest of the session. So, come at us. What do you want to know? Okay, so, something to the So that exact uh, concept would be something that we would very happily weave into the, to the next GovCMS camp. We might actually set some very specific targets of let's get the media module working, let's get some of these other bugs that we found. I think, I think that's important that you consult with the wider community 
Yep. Beforehand, because they have they have their own types of problems and they have their patients that they need to work on. And most of the time, that's not enough. It's just that people don't have enough time. You know, yep. Today. So it's what we're talking about that we're working on. Yeah. That might be financial, but we're also spending more time on the people who are not part of the project. It's just important. Yep. Yeah, absolutely, and I think um, one of the things that uh, that's happened with Drupal Seven as well, we've got some particularly talented. Uh, developers internally at the moment that have contributed back uh, and so it is something that we'll continue to do um, you know we're only a very small team uh, and so you know I'll be honest and say that the the level of contribution that we're able to contribute back you know is not is not massive and that's why we, we do the whole community thing and try to solve some of those underlying issues and then try to push those back out so um, but we've got uh, two staff members in particular uh, that are that are you know very good and have you know decade long experience with uh, the Drupal community, um, co you know author and maintain a number of modules and uh, and also regularly uh, patch and give feedback to uh, to the community as well. So and that's just through the work that they do during the day. Uh, I know there is work that gets done from those guys after hours as well across their their various projects. Absolutely. I think it's absolutely something that we should uh, do more of in that space. Yep. Thank you. What's Hagar on Group 7? Are you going to call Hagar from Group 8? Or are you going to call Yeah, that's a good and valid question. The answer is maybe, maybe not. Um, the guys are currently looking at Lightning as a reasonable starting point. Um, they have done some work looking at some of the other distributions that are around. Um, one of the things we learned from the Drupal 7 experience is that to a degree we inherit a bit of technical debt from time to time. Now sometimes that's okay, that's part of the, part of the process. Um, we just need to evaluate the impact of that. Um, and my important thing is actually I don't want to determine what is in the distro. I need the community to start telling us the things that need to be in the distro. And that's probably a little bit different to how some of the distros have been put together right now. Yeah, I think that's it's fairly important that we start from a light base. Um, so I, I'd almost rule out that we would fork Agub again. I don't think that that's where we want to go. Um, you know, we are looking at Lightning as a, as a reasonably light base to, to start that journey uh, because it's got some really good defaults and some really good initial functionality um, to just kickstart us on that journey. Um, and we've had some discussions, obviously, with um, uh, with Acquia, who you know, custodians of that project, as to you know how we might be able to uh, to work together on that. Um, but yeah, I think it's still early days, and there's a lot of scope for discussing how that looks. Major, um, you mentioned about yeah. the minimum viable product for Drupal eight. Is there a documentation on what's the minimum viable product? Because, I mean, because understanding what's the minimum requirement, we can actually try to work towards that and try to fit whatever that we are doing currently towards that minimum viable product. That documentation doesn't exist yet because we haven't got that far down the project pathway yet. Would you like to contribute to that? Yeah, definitely. I think that's part of what Nathan was saying as well before in terms of we're doing some experiments in the space where we know that where there are pain points because we work with, with Drupal 7 currently. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that we're going to get and solve all of those straight up, uh, but we would like to find you know, some implementation partners um, you know, initially, maybe work with them on some of those particular requirements uh, and build an MVP around that. Uh, and that'll give us skin in the game in terms of being able to, uh, to deliver something that's workable straight away. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We've probably got time for one very quick question. Mm. Yeah, one at the back. What impact will the Services panel The Drupal Services panel will actually make it easier for agencies to procure professional services. So when they're working on their sites, it's going to be easier for them to engage expertise from the market. 
The short answer is that uh, it probably doesn't have a lot of impact on Drupal 8 specifically, no. Well, it'll support both. Okay, I think it's time for a switch over and heading into the last session for the day. Thank you. Thank you.